Hello and welcome and thank you for joining with me today. Uh, my name is Pastor Ken Ortiz and these are basically, we call them morning devotionals, although many people do them at all different times of the day or even multiple times at one day. Uh, they're really simply short devotionals designed, <coughs> as you can see I'm, I'm struggling with a real um, vicious cold here, but they're short devotionals designed to help us um, they kind of take a deeper look on the passages of scripture that we read. Sometimes we just kind of read through the text, but we don't spend a lot of time thinking about them and particularly kind of uh, really breaking them down so that we can take a deeper look and see how they might have implications and applications to our day-to-day -day life. Um, over the past uh, several months, we've been going through what are called the, uh, the, the prison epistles of the Apostle Paul, particularly Ephesians, Colossians, and uh, Philippians. And uh, <clears throat> we came to the end of that here recently. And so today we're going to start a whole new series of studies going from the prison letters to Paul's pastoral epistles. And <clears throat> although it would be correct to say that uh, one of these epistles, 2 Timothy, was also written from prison, but it was written at a much later time and during Paul's second imprisonment in Rome. Uh, what we're looking at here really are personal letters of many ways, but they're designed to give instruction on how these two pastors, Timothy and Titus, can effectively lead the church and maybe even on a more important level to Paul, recognizing that he is coming to the end of his earthly journey and his earthly ministry, uh, really wanted to lay down some principles and values, some foundations upon which the church could continue to grow and work through the difficult challenge of finding leaders. In fact, we find in 1 Timothy and also in the letter to Titus that when we combine them together, there's something like 21 different qualifiers that Paul lists there, that if a person is going to be a leader within the church, uh, and it's particularly implying a, a pastoral elder leader, <clears throat> someone who teaches the word and, and guides people in spiritual ways, that there are certain levels of achievement that they have to come to in their life, or we might say there's a certain level of maturity that they have to achieve. And that's the whole point is that we are uh, born into Christ by the Holy Spirit. And like any child that is born, the expectation is that we'll grow into maturity. And sometimes that's a challenge. Sometimes that doesn't happen. In fact, uh, Paul in writing to the Corinthians talked about how that they were still basically infantile in their faith because of the carnality of their behavior. There was a lack of spiritual maturation and he said that really was indicated by the fact that they were busy fighting about position and roles and leadership. In other words, they were trying to establish their own personal identity rather than trying to take on the identity of Christ. And so when Paul begins to lay all these things out, he says that there are certain things that should really mark your life. And he's not talking about perfectionism. I think many times people get thrown away by one of the very first things that Paul said, that a, an elder must be above reproach. And we read that as being, you've never done anything wrong. Uh, and that's not uh, at all what that statement implies. But what it does imply is that we are a work in progress, that we don't leave sin unaddressed in our life. And I think that's the real challenge that we have because many times there are things that we just don't want to deal with. We would like to kind of lock them away in a closet so that we don't have to really confront stuff about ourselves that isn't attractive and isn't good looking. And yet, when we come to Christ, if we really want to grow, we want to go forward, there are some things that we just have to do, that we will stunt our growth if we don't begin to address these things. Now, I know some of you are saying to yourself, I don't ever plan on being a pastor of a church or even any kind of high-level leadership within a church. But the truth of the matter is that it's God's will that you serve some way. And, to, and you serve some group of people. And that means you create this sphere of influence where your walk with God actually touches the lives of other people. Whether you want that or not, it's going to happen. And so the challenge becomes, how do I live my Christianity out in a way that uh, really makes people want to have what I have, as opposed to just simply being a set of rules that I follow? And of course, we understand that grows out of the intimacy of a spiritual relationship with God. But it reminds me a lot of what God said to Israel when he called them out of Egypt. In the book of De Deuteronomy, when he told them that he they were his chosen people, his special treasure, his precious possession, uh, he said, I want you to understand that I didn't choose you because you're better than everybody else or that you're stronger. 
Uh, and the fact of the matter is, he said, you were the weakest of all people. And so when we look at the nation of Israel, when they're in Egypt, they're slaves, which is the lowest status you could possibly have in the world then and probably even today. But secondly, he said that they, were, they weren't really a nation. They were more like a, a crowd, a group of people. The, the 12 tribes of Israel were more like cousins who couldn't really get along with each other. And we see that dynamic throughout their history. But they weren't really formed into a, a national identity with a central purpose. And even we don't know to what degree they had centralized their worship because we find various things that indicate to us that they were kind of mixing things up, that they worshiped the God of Israel, the God of their fathers, but they were also probably worshiping other gods on the side. In a way, it's the idea that, you know, basically I'll grease any palm that will advance my, uh, my desires and, and things I want to accomplish. And we see that even to the point when they're being, when they're delivered out of Egypt and things get hard, they want to go back into Egypt because in their mind, and this is the way our minds work, we forget about the bad times and only remember the good times. We want to go back and, and relive the easier times. Sometimes things in the past weren't better. They were just easier. And I find this oftentimes for you and me as Christians that when we have to, as Paul said, fight the good fight of faith in his last letter to Timothy, that we just get tired of the conflict. We get tired of the struggle and we want to kind of find a place where we can glide and abide and everything becomes fairly easy and not so complicated. Well, the problem with that is that not only will it rob us of the joy and the sense of fulfillment and purpose, that is really critical to feeling good about yourself and, and making a difference in the world. There's none of us who just want to survive. We really do want to matter. We want our, uh, our time on this earth to account for something that has eternal consequences. Now, unsaved people worry all the time about what kind of uh, earthly or worldly impact they can have. Can they have something named after them? They put a statue up about you. I think about stars who uh, have their, their star put on the Hollywood walkway, you know, as the, their, their mark of accomplishment and knowing that in the future people will walk over the top of it and see their name and maybe they'll be remembered. Well, the sad thing about that is, is <clears throat> even if they do remember you and even if they remember you fondly, they, there's no reward for you in that. You're gone. And it's what lies beyond the grave that is really of greater consequence. So, when Paul is talking to, to Timothy and to Titus, these two young men who were really key players in his apostolic band, if you will, that he had entrusted them with a great deal of responsibility, he's telling them, you know, I'm not going to be here forever. And we really need to be careful to make sure that we're laying the kind of foundations that will enable the work to continue to go forward. And that means you have to pick people of the right kind of character, the right kind of quality of commitment. It's interesting that Paul, Paul says that these leaders have to be able to teach. In other words, they have to have an ability to communicate the Word of God, but he doesn't say anything about how eloquent they are uh, or how, how, excuse me, how charming or, or personable they are. It's all about trying to really fulfill the call of God by living out the character of Christ most accurately and effectively we can. Well, the letters that we're going to be looking at again are 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and then Titus. And all three of these were written by the Apostle Paul between the years of 60, 62 and 66 AD. Um, we know that Paul had been in prison in Rome and may have been released. And uh, we know that he had a period of freedom, and there's all sorts of speculation as to what exactly he may have done. The question is, did Paul ever make it to Spain, as he said to the Roman in his letter to them? Well, we don't know for sure, but what we do know is that uh, he was rearrested, and he was condemned, and uh, was executed shortly after that. And so this, this period of time, this 62 to 66, is a very eventful time. And again, as I said, that Paul recognized that he was about to leave the ministry in the hands of younger men. And his prayer is that they will, uh, they will carry that load well. I think that every one of us should kind of have that kind of perspective. That many times we think about the way we live our lives and what we do as being all about us and about uh, how it affects us and benefits us. But the reality is that you will leave a remembrance in the minds of some others after you're gone. And the question is, is it going to be something that's going to encourage them to seek God as you did? Or is it 
going to be one where they look at you and say, well, he didn't really amount to much or it didn't really matter that he or she was here. I think it's really important for us to think through what kind of impact are we having in our lives right now? Well, I'm out of time. I'll pick this up tomorrow. Thank you.